The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. Happy Tuesday, the 15th of September. The webinar is just starting, and we are going to get going with the scale management, a look or a live demonstration of the toolbox approach. Um, I'm Chris Haugen, and my co-presenter is Patrick Anderson. Um, we are going to be covering the three different time zones at the moment. Patrick's uh, in his backyard arboretum in North Carolina. I'm out uh, in Mountain Standard Time at the moment. And then we also have Matt Karst on the line here. He's going to be helping us out with uh, doing some of the questions and making sure that all the AV equipment works as well. So as we get going here, a couple of um, brief housekeeping items. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the question box and uh, Matt will bring them to my attention. Um, we may choose to, to answer them at the end or maybe you're getting a little bit of ahead of us. Um, so we'll answer those as we go or as it's appropriate. We are, as you'll notice, recording this webinar so it will be available afterwards. So you can uh, share it with your colleagues or if there's maybe something you missed or you have additional questions on, you can certainly check it out again. And then also, um, if we are doing CEUs for this, so make sure you type in your ISA or uh, uh, ISA, whatever credits you need, type in your ID number into the chat box and then we'll get those submitted for you afterwards. And certainly as we go through, um, please do ask questions. Um, while this is a webinar, if you will, we are having a live in-field portion with Patrick. So if there's something you wanna see again, or you'd like additional clarification, or you'd maybe like us to, to, to show you something up more closely, make sure you ask, because um, we wanna make sure we get all of those questions uh, answered so that you have a live experience as well. So as we get started, <clears throat> I am Chris Haugen. Um, I'm based in Minnesota primarily. We have Matt uh, on the line helping us out with the AV stuff and questions. And then PA will be doing all the field portion. So we'll be kind of batting it back and forth. I'll share a few slides to kind of give you some of the technical information and then Patrick will go out in the field for us. What we're looking to accomplish today is to provide you with the knowledge needed to build a successful scale management program. And then to give you an understanding of how to apply each tool properly to achieve your goals. What we won't be doing is going through individual scale protocols. We'll use a couple as examples, but we're not gonna go through a laundry list of here's how you manage X scale as, a, as basically just a recipe. We wanna provide you with the, the technical information and the background to be able to build a management program that fits each individual scale and then your landscape and your client's needs as well. <clears throat> but as we get started, we first need to really go through and understand what is the path that we're actually dealing with. So what is a scale? Scales are in the insect family and they're, the, they're in the order of Hemiptera, which is the same as aphids, adelgids, and whiteflies. And really, I think what, what distinguishes them and brings them together is how they're actually feeding. So we look at their piercing and sucking mouth parts, and those are really what are kind of bringing all these insect orders together. But they are highly modified. And the adult females, and this is important for really a, a key management uh, a life stage, is the adult females usually lack wings, not all of them, but most lack wings, legs, or segmentation. So they're not as mobile as many other insects like you might see with white flies or aphids. But that doesn't mean that they can't move around on the plant. It just means they typically don't move from tree to tree or plant to plant. It takes them longer to move. So typically you don't have uh, the infestation moving on a property as quickly as you might with other insects. Breaking it down further, there are five scale families, but really there's two that we deal with in the landscape as arborists. There's what we call soft scales or armored scales. And then the key distinguishing factor being whether there's honeydew, 
So the honeydew that is secreted from those soft scales or not. And what we look at, um, when we look at in the landscape what their impact is on plants, it really is typically an aesthetic issue. Oftentimes we aren't seeing plant decline or death with scales, generally. But I think over the last probably three to four years as we've kind of internally rainbow here talked about some of the, the technical issues that we've had clients ask me about, we are seeing a higher prevalence of actual plant decline and death as a result of scale infestations. And that's due to a variety of factors, um, whether it's climate change, um, management options, maybe not working as effectively as they used to, or it could be just the, the general stressed nature that a lot of our plant material is living in. We are seeing the aesthetic appeal most certainly, but also it's an actual plant health concern as well. But if we take it back to what our clients, our clients' clients, asking about and talking about and what's their concern, oftentimes it's the honeydew and the resulting sooty mold from soft scales that is the biggest concern for them. The honeydew, which is that sweet uh, uh, material that is raining down off of the plant from the, the, the scale insects, and it's a perfect growing medium for sooty mold. So it might be landing on their, their cars, their decks, their hardscapes, and the honeydew can be attractive for insects like bees or hornets because it's a very sweet uh, substance. From the plant's perspective though, it's a decrease in the photosynthetic activity which can cause economic losses. Maybe you've got to, they've got to replace plant material or the quality is decreased. Um, so all of those can be an issue and an impact on the plants. If we look at just kind of a diagnostic, just kind of general rule of thumb, soft scales will typically give you a whole leaf impact. You'll see decline on the entire leaf or the entire branch. Armored scales typically give you a single cell impact. And this is a difference of how and where they're feeding in the plant. Soft scales are feeding on the phloem and armored scales are feeding on individual cells. If we look a little bit deeper here, into soft scales uh, the, from the family Coisidae, I mentioned that there's really only two that are of, of practical importance for uh, uh, landscape practitioners. They're typically larger. They can be up to a quarter inch or larger. Um, the, the scale outside is typically smooth or has kind of a cottony uh, outer appearance, and they're generally rounded in shape. Um, you don't have the oblong shapes that you often do with some of the, the armored scales. And they are going to be feeding on that phloem sap. This is where the honeydew is coming from. As they insert that stylet or that, that piercing mouth part, it's basically a tube or a straw that then that, that, that sap flow is pushing through them. And they're not actually sucking on it. It's actually the, the pressure from the, the plant and their their flow pressure pushing through and then it's excreting all that excess uh, sap flow. And that causes sooty mold. As we look at kind of you know, how they reproduce, a single soft scale can produce hundreds to thousands of eggs. And this is also important because they generally have only one generation per year. Now, depending on where you are in the country and your climate, sometimes you can have two generations or maybe a generation and a half um, we're seeing that become more prevalent, especially as the climates are becoming generally more warm or winter is less aggressive. Maybe it's not as deep a cold or just the warm temperatures last longer into the fall or earlier into the, into the spring. And most of these are going to overwinter as nymphs. Now, keep in mind that overwintering as a nymph, when we start talking about some of our management strategies with horticultural oil, on the right there, you can see just a general kind of uh, life cycle for most soft scales. And you'll notice that crawlers, which are what we commonly call the nymphs, emerge typically and move to the leaves and feed in that late May to June period. Some scales, like maybe magnolia scale, for example, that can be later into July or August, but most of them are going to be in the early spring.
as we transition over to armored scales, you'll notice that they are certainly much smaller. Uh, typically, they're smaller than an eighth of an inch long. Uh, most armored scales, you, know, you may be able to see them visually, uh, the adults, without a, the assistance of a hand lens. To see the crawlers or other life stages, you're probably going to need at minimum a hand lens or potentially a microscope to really see these guys. Um, but they typically have a waxy shell. They do not produce honeydew. So this is especially important as we're talking about um, our systemic options. In most life stages, they are not mobile. So you're not gonna see these moving around a whole lot on the plant. And inversely to the soft scales, you'll see they don't produce nearly as many eggs per insect. But they balance that out by having oftentimes several generations per year or extended crawler emergence. And then they can overwinter as nymphs and adults. So in some cases with your armored scales, you'll be getting some portion of the population with a, a dormant oil, but not other parts. So it's a little more of a complicated life cycle. Um, and you can also have some generations overlapping. Um, you can have some first generation still alive and active while you have a second generation emerging. So it just takes a little bit more um, uh, patience and certainly some understanding of how the management works. And certainly acknowledging that there's hundreds of scale species out there, we wanna make sure that you're getting the best information you can. So not everybody knows everything. Um, not, no single person has all the answers. So make sure you use the support that's available to you. So we have ID support via Rainbow Scientific, uh, our technical support. You can call us, uh, text us, or email or live chat. And it's especially helpful if you can email us photos um, of the scale of the plant or what you think you're dealing with. And we'll be able to give you live in-field support uh, to help you diagnose it and then build a management strategy around that. On top of that, use your, uh, uh, your extension services. I think some of them have fantastic uh, resources for scale ID or when crawlers emerge for the phenology. So these are just Four of them that I kind of picked um, from across the country that I think have really good scale insect, not only guides, but also photos. The really high quality photos to help you do the diagnostics are super important. So use these, use us. We want to make sure that you get a good idea on what you're, what you're dealing with out in the field. As we transition over to kind of the toolbox of how do you actually manage these insects? We call it the Rainbow Scale Toolbox. Um, and you'll notice that we have several different uh, tools available to us. Everything ranging from a, a soil or a bark spray applied systemic option to a trunk injected option to a crawler stage spray and finally some, some dormant oil as well. Each of these may be a part of your management protocol. But what's important is that you're looking at, when you're looking at what scale you're treating and what your goals are for the property, that you're looking at a 12-month cycle. Most scale insects don't require just one treatment of one thing and then you're done and you forget it. You may have to make multiple visits and really it's about then setting expectations with the, the property owner of this treatment is going to control or do this. So for example, let's uh, we'll talk about dormant oils more in depth, but the dormant oil may be to treat for the overwintering nymphs to reduce that population in the spring to make it a little more manageable so that then when you apply your soil applied or bark applied transtech, you're getting better control so there's less of a population to control. It's all kind of what is this treatment, how does it fit into your toolbox and what is your goal for each. And we'll kind of go through in a kind of a visualized year of so this is the scale we're treating, and this is what we're planning to treat with it. So that you'll see from start of, you know, maybe in the spring as a dormant treatment, all the way through the fall into what we would do for a crawler stage spray. So if, as we look at this and we're working on, and we'll have out in a, a few weeks, a, a, a scale management guide. But if you look at just kind of some of the tools that are available for soft scales in particular, if you're looking at, soft scales, and this is important that 
you'll note that Zytex is listed as a treatment recommendation only for soft scales. And it's because where they're actually feeding the plant. Zytex is going to be moving within the xylem tissue. And if the, the scale is an armored scale, it's not going to be feeding on the xylem. So you're not going to have as much uh, control. The, the insecticide isn't going to move from the xylem cell into the, the adjacent cells where the actual armored scales are feeding. So it doesn't provide you a high level of control. But for some scales like lacanium scale, it can be a great option for managing and, and keeping populations in check. It, and it can be applied early in the spring. And then as we move into the other options, you maybe are looking at more of the Transtech uh, uh, bark spray or infusible as options in addition to a crawler stage spray with proxite. Looking at the armored scales or the hard scales, you'll notice your, your options are slightly less uh, or more limited, pardon me. You have no option for using Zytex because it just isn't effective on armored scales. However, we do see very nice eff effectiveness on many armored scales with Transtech, but you'll notice that you have more of the horticultural oil as a part of it uh, for your dormant sprays, and then also proxite again for your crawler stage sprays. So let's start with, <clears throat> let's imagine ourselves, it's, it's maybe February or or March, or in some cases in the US, it might be early April. You're gonna start your season with doing a dormant oil application. The great thing about dormant oils is that it, it can be used on generally all plant material. Um, it's going to give you the most broad range control, but there are some drawbacks to it. It isn't, um, it, 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 it's suffocating the scale, is how its mode of action effectively works. So it does require complete coverage of the entire plant. It doesn't move translaminarly. So think of it as, as basically covering the plant in an oil or a wax. If you don't spray the bottom side of the leaf, that waxy or oil covering where the scale might be residing wouldn't come in contact with them. So you're not going to have any impact on the insect. Similarly, it has to be at a susceptible life stage. Scales, in particular the ones that I mentioned that overwinter as nymphs in adults, can be controlled by horticultural oil, but not if they're overwintering as eggs, as in the case of oyster shell scale. So make sure you're really looking at what scale you have to make sure that that life stage is susceptible to horticultural oil. Um, and there are certainly some restrictions on temperature that you would wanna make sure that it's not too cold or it's too hot, or in particular, if you're looking at conifers or more sensitive plants like maples, that you're not mixing it too high of a concentration because then it can cause a phytotoxic burn to it. So here I'll kick it over to Patrick in the field uh, to, to give us a quick demo of horticultural oil. And he's also got some great examples of uh, scale in the field. Excellent, thank you, Chris. So if you transition over here. All right, so here we are. This is a great example. We're talking about kind of the scale toolbox approach and going through the season. So here we have an example of what we're talking about when we talk about that dormant oil, uh, or that dormant time to apply uh, horticultural oil. So here we have a plant. Let's pretend in this case, uh, as Chris mentioned, it's in April, maybe March, maybe May, depending on where you are in the country. And right now we don't have any leaves on. So this would be a perfect example of a dormant plant where we could use a higher rate of horticultural oil, and you're from that two to three percent horticultural oil rate in that case there. And so when we spray, as Chris mentioned, that we're only we're smothering the insect, so this isn't going to absorb into the plant and then be translocated up. We're kind of smothering a dormant insect. So when we spray, we're going to spray. We're going to make sure that we're coating that stem to coat that insect. Likewise, some plants might be evergreen plants or plants that don't lose their leaves in the wintertime. In which case, when we spray, not only do we want to spray down onto the plant, but we're going to make sure we get those leaves because we don't have insects overwintering 
on those leaf tissues as well. So we want to make sure that we're coating the plant where that insect is actually uh, spending its time. Now let's look at some examples. So a few things Chris had mentioned is the species of scale and how it overwinters and why that's important. So to reinforce what Chris mentioned, we're going to get more predictable control of scale insects that are overwintering as specifically nymphs or adults. So here I have an example here, we have a lacanium scale. So this is the adult lacanium scale. This is her um, body left over, she's no longer um, live. But those nymphs now have made it back into the leaves and they're overwintering here on the stem. So something like a lacanium scale, this would be a good time, this would be a good example of a scale that I would treat with horticultural oil to try to smother those overwintering instars. Likewise, we have a twofer on this plant. So this white stuff that you're seeing, it's not mold and it's not the actual uh, nymph of the lacanium scale. This is white peat scale. The white peat scale overwinters as an adult. So this is something else that we might get really good control of if we get good distribution um, of our horticultural oil on that stem. Another example. Hey, Chris Patrick. Mentioned, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have one uh, participant saying they can't see you. Um, can we take a quick poll, make sure everyone can see Patrick's webcam? Yeah, and maybe that's a good point. We should we should kind of walk over. So if you're not familiar with go to uh, uh, meeting or go to webinar, pardon me, make sure to see Patrick. You're clicking on um, view webinar or uh, webcam. I'll give it a moment. I'll take a cue from you, Matt, one to get going again. Right. And Patrick, uh, just to kind of while people are kind of checking on your webcam there. Um, yeah. About how how many uh, uh, dormant oil applications would you anticipate? would be kind of the average or what, what when, when you're looking at dormant oil how many are you looking at doing in a growing season that's a great question so i'd probably only do one in a given season um, and that's while we're waiting some things that uh, we can talk about are um, temperature so when you're doing dormant oil we're doing a dormant spray we want to make sure that we're going to have at least 24 hours without temperatures dropping below 32 degrees fahrenheit uh, and the reason for that is we can get desiccation of the plant so that below freezing temperature is going to create you know um, the plant's going to want to move moisture in from that succulent tissue back into the plant to protect it from freezing and as oil dries it pulls moisture from the plant so if we have those two things going on we have the risk of phytotoxicity when using it so that's part of what we're looking for when we're scheduling treatments is to make sure that we're going to be in a, in a window that we're not going to have temperatures below freezing for that time. Perfect. So just real quick on the on the webcam, if if you're not familiar with this, make sure you have your control panel clicked on, because it might be that you have your webcam or viewing webcams hidden behind maybe another uh, uh, screen or panel that you have. Just make sure you've got that clicked on there. And if you're having issues, uh, uh, just send us a, a quick chat, and uh, Matt can help you uh, uh, get get uh, get uh, that pulled up for you. Good to go, PA. Yeah, other people. Okay, we'll get back to it. So the other thing that I wanted to point out to everyone was um, Chris had mentioned soft scales specifically, and soft scales they generally overwinter as mint. So one diagnostic thing that we can look for for soft scales is sooty mold. So when you see sooty mold on a plant, in this case here, we have a Burford holly, and we have, um, in the past, we had an infestation here of cottony camellia scale, which is a soft scale. So when you see sooty mold on a plant and you suspect scale, you're probably dealing with a soft scale, and that's probably overwintering as a nymph. So this would be another scale as I'm scouting a property. This is something that I would use a dormant oil. So let's look at the actual application of the dormant oil. So as I mentioned, we need to make sure we're getting good distribution down on the plant. So for our tree that is dormant with no leaves on it, we wanna make sure we're gonna spray down and coat that plant. Let me turn on the pressure here a little bit. I'm gonna spray down on the plant, 
getting really good distribution coating down onto those stems. Whereas over here on my evergreen plant, not only do I want to scrape that I'm spraying down on the plant itself, make sure I'm coating down. But if I have insects overwintering on the underside of those leaves, remember this is not a systemic need to actually come in contact with the insect. So I also want to make sure I'm spraying up underneath those leaves to ensure that I'm getting good contact with the insect on that plant. So if there's no questions there, Chris, let's kick it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. So we'll talk here briefly about um, about our systemic control. So imagine we've done our dormant oil applications. Um, now we're getting more into the actively growing season where the leaves are going to be starting, starting to emerge on the plant. Really, when we talk about systemics, we're really talking about primarily two products. And by systemic, we mean that the plant itself is going to be distributing that chemistry within the plant for us to take it to the site where the, the insect is actually feeding. Zytec, our soil applied imidacloprid, um, and we do have a trunk injection as well, but it is applied typically for scale management early in the spring, um, typically even before the leaves are even on the plant, because it does have a delay. It requires at minimum 30 to 45 days to move from the soil profile through the root system, through the xylem, and then be distributed into the plant. The good part about that is it can be done when you don't have a lot of maybe other foliar leaf disease sprays going on, um, but it's only effective on soft scales. So like Patrick mentioned, um, with lacanium scale or tulip tree scale, this may be a great option for if you've had a history of these scales in the past, this is a good option to keep that, that population in check. The downside is it's potential, it's potential for causing a mite flare up. That can occur as well. So especially if you're thinking about some of your conifer plants or plants where you've had a history of mite issues, you may want to look at using TransTech. TransTech is a, a, a dinotectron based product. Focus your soil applications and your bark spray applications 14 to 30 days prior um, at minimum to expected scale activity. So this can be applied later into the growing season. So you wanna time that to when you anticipate having more of the actual feeding activity, instead of say in March or late February, you might be looking at uh, May timeframe for uh, a, a early June uh, scale activity. And it is effective on both soft and armored scales. So while you do need to distinguish between the two in order to determine the life cycle, um, you're gonna have efficacy on both as a, as in a systemic. And we don't see the associated mite flare-ups with, with dinotectron as we would with imidacloprid. So keep that in mind um, as you're looking at what you should use. And having the option of doing a bark spray versus a soil application is not only just operationally efficient, um, but you can also, for some of those smaller plants, it's a little easier to determine a dosage or get even in complete coverage in the plant because you're not relying on the root system to distribute the product as much for you. That can be one of the reasons why you expect or you may have uh, reduced performance or you've seen failures in the past is if the soil profile is very dry and there's no moisture to actually translocate that, that material, that is why you may not have as much uh, control with Zytec in particular. Transtech is much more water soluble, so it moves more quickly within the plant, and it'll actually move from that phloem and xylem tissue laterally into some of those other individual cells, which is where, why it's more effective uh, with armored scales. So if we're gonna do a soil injection, we can certainly do a soil drench, which may be appropriate for some of the smaller plants, uh, maybe if they're more of an ornamental shape, um, but if you're going to be doing more of the tree form, you can do a soil injection. And Patrick is going to demonstrate here the soil uh, injection with the HTI 2000, but you're targeting right at the base of the target plant. We don't want to be doing these applications out in the, into the canopy or the drip line. We want to target that immediate root flare to make sure that all of our insecticide is going into that targeted tree. So as we go through it here, 
I'll let Patrick, uh, I'll kick it back to you here to, to do a, a soil injection. Thanks a lot, Chris. That back there. Gonna take control just for a second. Okay. Can everyone see me? You need to stop sharing your screen. I need to stop sharing my screen. I sure do need to stop sharing my screen. Okay. How about now? Still there. Still there? My screen is still there? I'm still there. The uh, screen we'll sharing is still there. There we go. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. Hey there. How about now? Perfect. perfect. We can see it perfect. perfectly. A lot of buttons on this thing here. Okay. So Chris mentioned using early season systemic applied soil products are a great way to manage a lot of scale impact. Um, so what we're targeting here is we want, one, we want the soil not to be frozen. So we want thawed soils and really any time after we get that soil thawed or we start getting early spring, we can begin these applications. Now, another thing that Chris mentioned, especially with our Zytec applications, is that we're going to have to make sure we time our applications to get enough product into that tree for when those scale insects begin to feed. So that can take anywhere from 30 days to 45 days. Soil moisture is really important. So if you don't have adequate soil moisture or if you're in a part of the country that doesn't have a lot of soil moisture anyhow, your uptake times are going to be increased. That's the things that you need to consider when doing soil applications, especially the early spring applications with a metaclover. Now, a cool tool that you can use for these is the HTI 2000. This is what I have right here. So what this does is this meters out your product. So we have a 250 milliliter canister in here. And so I'm pulling from my backpack into the HTI and I'm getting an even dose every time. I'll demonstrate that. Let me turn on my backpack here. Might get a little. So I'm gonna push the fill button and you'll notice that my canister will fill. See it fill up there. And then when I push the inject button, that's gonna put the product into the soil. So I'm injecting right now. You may see if you put that on behind me. So if I'm going to go up to the tree, I'm going to measure the tree diameter of breast height. So if I have a five inch diameter tree, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to try to get this as close as I can to the tree. I'm going to push it into the soil. I'm going to hit my fill button. I'm going to fill my HCI. I'm going to push my inject button. I'm going to inject that into the tree. And I'm going to go to my next site. So again, for a five inch tree, I want to get five injection sites evenly distributed around the base of the tree as close as I can without, of course, damaging the player or the bark. Chris, let's kick it back over to you. Yeah, and you'll notice as he was doing that, he's making sure to avoid having any of the, the soil, uh, you know, if he had turf or maybe landscape fabric, you want to make sure that you're getting underneath that landscape fabric to get to the actual mineral soil where the root system is. And I'll touch on just real quickly, as Patrick mentioned, um, with kind of timing for some of these soil uh, uh, management protocols. For Zytec, you're looking uh, 30 to 120 days prior to crawl or emergence. So you want to make sure that you're timing it appropriately to when you'll expect crawlers to emerge. You can't use uh, Zytec as a just-in-time treatment. Think of it maybe more as your maintenance uh, for soft scales. Transtech, you've got two to four weeks prior to crawl or emergence. So again, you're giving yourself kind of a nice window to operate into. And then I didn't mention this, but it is certainly an option. Um, it's a much shorter life uh, cycle product, but Lefitech soil can be used as well as kind of your, your last minute rescue treatment for maybe trees that you aren't able to uh, foliar spray for crawlers as well. And then we'll touch on here next a little bit on Transtech as a lower bark spray. Um, so a little bit more on basal bark sprays here. So similar to a soil application, we are going to be using the tree to self-distribute all of our insecticide for us. And we have Transtech, and it comes in water-soluble packets, which Patrick will demonstrate how you mix those here shortly. But the rate is 6 to 12 water-soluble packets per gallon solution. Um, consider that higher rate 
for maybe trees that are above 25 dBH inches. Um, and that's because you're really trying to get the chemistry to distribute throughout the entire canopy to all plant parts. And if you are gonna be using it for say EAB, start at the eight packets per gallon solution. But it gives you a very nice and easy way to, to um, mix that product and get it up, up into the tree. And once it's mixed, apply at 1.5 to two fluid ounces solution per dBH inch. Now that is gonna depend upon the bark thickness. So if you're looking at maybe oaks uh, where they have a thicker, corkier bark, you're probably gonna be using more of that closer to that two, point, uh, two fluid ounces per dBH inch. But for maybe a smoother barked tree, maybe like a magnolia or a crepe myrtle, for example, you're probably gonna be closer to that 1.5 fluid ounce uh, uh, rate. What's important to note is that the molecule of dinotafuron is so small and so water soluble that it, it's able to penetrate through and pass through that bark tissue to give you that, that systemic activity. So this is a really nice tool that gives you the ability to treat many trees very quickly. And think about maybe locations where there's a, a limited root zone where you aren't able to do a soil application. This is a really efficient way to treat lots and lots of trees. So I'll kick it over back to you, Patrick, out in the field to go over bark sprays. Awesome, thanks. Now bark sprays, these are an up and coming use. And actually they've been around probably for a while now. Um, there's some new ones to bark sprays though that we're gonna cover. But the first thing Chris mentioned is transect in the water soluble pack and how that breaks down. And now this is a really neat distinction here using Transtex. So Transtex comes in a pre-measured water-soluble packet, and that's an example of what it is. This is pre-measured, so you are we are very confident in your dose here. There should be no error in mixing. And a lot of other dinotafurans, the the dry forms are are measured, they're weighed out in actual weight, and then they're moved over to volume. And anytime you go from a weight measurement to a volume measurement, you're going to lose something in translation. You're either going to be under or overdosing your tree. So this is pre-weighed out. We know exactly how much dinotafurin is in here. And it breaks down readily in water. I know some folks in the past have had uh, bad experiences with water soluble packets, but just an example, I have just plain clean water. I have my packet, I'm gonna drop it in there and it starts breaking down almost immediately. And if you give it some agitation, so I have my nice little agitator here. You it's a very see, fancy stir stick, PA. You like my stir stick? Yeah. It's oh, going to yeah. start breaking down for us. Okay, it's probably have too much water in there. So you can see how it's, ah, there we go. Starting to break down really easily and goes into that solution with just a little bit of agitation. That's my invasive Atlantis stir stick here. So you can see how we have that nice broken down relatively fast. And that makes it really easy. So if I was going to pour this into my backpack, Chris mentioned, I would do a minimum of six packets in my backpack. I would do the backpack shake, agitate, give the solution, be really successful in our application. Now, a few things too, when we talk about bark application, the nuance of doing this correctly so you're not under or overdosing your tree. Chris mentioned that when we're doing transect, what we want to apply is we want to apply two ounces to one and a half ounces per inch diameter. So if I have a five inch diameter tree, I'm gonna to wanna to be applying at most 10 ounces to this. So how do I do that successfully? Well, here's some tips. One is, is I highly recommend the use of a control flow valve. So if you're not familiar with these, these keep it so that no matter how much you pressurize your tank, it's gonna come out at a controlled pressure. So this is 14 PSI. This is by Chapin. So you have this on here, so I can pump up my backpack as high as I want. It's only gonna spread at 14 PSI. The other advantage is, is if it, the tank drops below 14 PSI, it's gonna stop, it's gonna cut off. So I'm really confident at how much product is coming out of the end of this nozzle. The other part to this is going to be calibrating. So again, we only need to do one inch, or excuse me, one, two ounces to one and a half ounces per inch diameter. So one tip that I learned from a colleague is you can get your smartphone and download a metronome app. You ever had to take music class, you're probably familiar with that metronome. It goes tick, 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 
and you can measure, you can move it so it goes faster or slower. So what you want to do is download a metronome app and then calibrate it. So whatever you want it to do, I like to have mine calibrated so that every tick, so every tick, 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 that's one ounce of solution. So I have my metronome app out. I have it starting to click. And then all I do is I just take it. I have any old measuring container that has the hash marks on there. I'll turn on my app. It'll be going tick, 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 tick. I count how much comes out and however many amount of ticks. So again, with my app, I have it calibrated out to do one ounce of solution per tick. So that's how, if I'm doing a 10 inch tree and I want to put on two ounces of solution, I'm going to listen for 10 ticks, right? The other thing I highly recommend is using a flat fan nozzle. So a lot of these backpack sprayers will come with that hollow cone nozzle. And that's fine for a lot of different applications, but the flat fan gives you kind of two dimensions of spray. So if I'm trying to spray on the bark of a tree like this, I have it going in just that one kind of plane, that one dimension, so I'm not getting a lot of blowback on that. The other thing I like to do when doing a bark spray is I like to have my face shield down because if a wind or something kicks up, you have some fine spread, it can come back and get you in the face. So always remember to wear your PPE, understand the label of the PPE. But now if I'm gonna go spray this tree, I'm gonna have about a five inch diameter tree. I'm gonna take out my app. I'm gonna click on my metronome app. It's clicking so that I'm doing one ounce of solution per click. I know I'm really confident in that because I have my control flow valve on. So I'm gonna to go to the tree and pressurize it as much as I want. And I'm just gonna go at 14 PSI and I'm gonna get even distribution of the product around the base of the tree from about five feet down, making sure I'm also covering the root flares. And that's a really nice, uh, having the, the, the pressure gauge, or not gauge, but the, the, the regulator allows you to use that metronome app. Otherwise, the process would be you'd have to time yourself and time your cadence of walking around the tree with your arm motion to get that 1.5 to 2 fluid ounce rate, correct? Exactly. And the only nice thing about it is because it's constantly clicking. Let's say, for instance, I was trying to go around this side of the tree, but I can't get in between these two trees. I could stop here. Let's say I've already counted off eight clicks. I know I have two clicks left. I could stop here. I can walk around to this side of the tree to get where I need to be and then just spray for two more clicks. I know I've got my 10 ounces on the tree and I'm moving on to the next one. That's a really great suggestion because I think it gives you that, that even and complete coverage to give you at the end of the day predictable results because you need to have that predictable amount of product in the tree. Absolutely. So if there's no questions there, Chris, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, thank you. So real quick, I'll finish off here uh, with kind of the last a little bit about our systemic options here. Um, one thing we didn't go over, which just due to lack of time, but we do have TransTech infusible. So we talked about TransTech as a soil injection or drench in a bark spray. We also have TransTech infusible as a trunk injectable version. Now, this is a really nice tool for maybe your trees that you aren't able to do a soil application or due to a pounds per acre restriction, or maybe just due to the size of the tree, you need to have this product in the tree faster and at a higher concentration. TransTech Infusible is a really nice option to utilize for this. Um, I think of this for maybe <clears throat> in Colorado with European Elm Scale, where you have really large trees with a lot of diameter inches. And this also gives you almost immediate control because unlike a bark sprayer or soil application, this is directly being put into the xylem tissue. So it's gonna translocate almost within that day. So you'll have very quick uptake and very quick distribution. So keep that in mind for maybe some of those uh, uh, trees where you, you, you can't do a bark spray or soil application, but you still need to get control. So this is a great option to keep in that toolbox as well for some of those more unique situations. And it comes in a one pint unit and the use rates are very low. So you're looking at one to four milliliters per diameter inch. And it doesn't need to be mixed with water, so it's very easy to apply, and it goes into the tree very quickly. So as we transition, kind of, you know, moving through our growing season, so we're maybe looking at now the crawler stage spray. 
So when we're talking about crawlers, this is when the scales are most active and they're gonna be moving around, but also they're the most susceptible to an insecticide treatment. So we talked about kind of that waxy coating. If you're spraying insecticides and, you're, and they're not moving or they're not in their crawler stage spray, the likelihood that they are going to be killed by that insecticide is relatively low. So this is why when we're talking about scale management, we're always talking about when's the growing degree day for the crawler stage. Make sure you're monitoring for the crawler stage. It's because this is the most effective time to use an insecticide to give you control. So we'll talk a little bit kind of about you know, T-scale in particular, kind of as, a, as a, just a general note here. And I like this example because it is a very prevalent scale in the Southeast, um, but it has many generations per growing season and it almost continuous crawlers through February through November. This is especially helpful um, for maybe using crawler stage sprays. So as we look at a crawler stage spray, we wanna make sure that we're getting those nymphs and they're the ones with the, the, the legs and the antennae. They are the most susceptible life stage. So once the nymphs find a suitable site, they'll start to begin feeding. So here you can see those nymphs, they're the little yellow things. Now on many armored scales, you're probably gonna need a hand lens or in some cases you might need a, a, a microscope to see these, but really you can start tracking them uh, if you're tracking your growing degree days based on maybe your IPM reports, whether it's from Maryland or Delaware. Use those reports to kind of get a sense of where you're at and when those crawlers will start to emerge. And then on individual properties, do a quick double check to make sure that you're seeing those crawlers before you spray. So I'm really pleased to, to provide and kind of introduce to you guys a new product from Rainbow Scientific, a product called Proxite. Proxite is a 11.23% pyroproxifen um, material that is for foliar spray, and it is highly effective against armored and soft scales in addition to white flies and thrips. But what makes this a unique material is that it, it doesn't work as a, as a standard insecticide like a pyrethrin or a bifenthrin. It's an insect growth regulator, so it fits very nicely into your IPM program or your insecticide resistance management program because it doesn't have the negative effect on many of the beneficial insects that we want to keep to reduce those, in, those scale populations. And it also doesn't have a pollinator box. So it's much softer on pollinators as well, but it is a foliar spray. And how it works is that it's a juvenile hormone which, mim which is mimicked in insects and disrupts their growth. So it prevents the scale from moving on to the next life stage, or it makes the females sterile and the eggs won't hatch. So it's not killing the insect or the scale instantaneously like you would have with a, a pyrethroid or a, or, a, or a bifenthrin, but it slows that population down so that it doesn't rebuild. Now that's important to note that it's not you know, an immediate knockdown, but your control is gonna be occurring within a few days. But it also does have translaminar movement. So like when Patrick was talking about with your, your dormant oil, this will move from the top half of the leaf to the bottom half and vice versa. So it does, it does give you a little bit more predictability with your foliar sprays. Patrick, I'll kick it over to you to go over doing a crawler stage spray. And I believe you actually may have some crawlers to show us if we can see them on cam. They're gonna be tough to see on camera, but here I can have a picture of one that I took with my Microscope, can you guys uh, let's see here? See if I can take control of the screen. There we go. So you guys can see my screen. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about a, specifically a T scale crawler right there. Um, so you can see how we have our little antenna right there. That's a crawl. That's what we're looking at. And so if I stop sharing my screen, and then you get a picture of me again. There you go. Let's see. There we go. See me again. What we're talking about here is this is the same plant 
And if we look at the symptoms there, we can see that we have this kind of yellow model and color. And then we turn that over. That's what we're looking at when we're looking at T scale. The T scale, again, it's an armored scale. It has continuous overlapping generations. As long as the temperature is right, you're going to have all phases on that plant at any one time. So this is a perfect opportunity for the use of Proxite. Now, a lot of folks um, in their scale management programs, when they're looking at crawler space, a lot of people are gonna be looking at doing things like um, bifenthrin. And so Proxite is a great alternative to using bifenthrin. Um, bifenthrin works incredibly well, but there's some downsides to it. One is it's a general insecticide. The bifenthrin or, or your pyrethroids, they're gonna kill just about everything, every arthropod on that plant. Uh, including beneficial insects, predators, and things like that. Uh, whereas Proxite is going to be a lot softer on those uh, insects. So it provides a really nice alternative from traditional insecticides, um, and it works extremely, extremely well. Um, so I'm really excited that we have this to offer um, this season and going further. And as Chris mentioned, the nice thing about this, the other downside of bifenthrin is bifenthrin is a contact. It's not a systemic. It persists in the environment. But if you have insects that are living on the underside of the leaves and you just spray the top of it and that insect never moves to the top side of the leaf, you're not going to get good control. Um, so that's the nice thing about Proxite is that we can spray the top of the leaf. If we don't get good control spraying underneath, we can spray the top of the leaf. It'll move into that leaf and the insect feeding on the underside there um, is going to consume that, that um, product and perish. So if we just look at a quick example, what spraying would look like. Again, you know, we could do something where we could spray just the top of the plant. I need to turn on my pressure, pardon me. And while he's doing that, a nice aspect of, of that is, especially if you're maybe not spraying trees, but you're doing shrubs where it's harder to get on the underside of the leaf, this is a great tool for shrub beds or ground cover that you can get that complete coverage and get that control. I think of like euonymus scale. I mean, super hard to control because it's on the ground and you can't get the bottom side. This is a great tool to add your arsenal to really give you that complete coverage. It's such a good distinction you brought there, Chris. Yeah, so I can spray the top of the plant and I'm comfortable that it's gonna move through the translaminar and those feeding on the underside are gonna consume it. And then again, key distinction with the proxylate is they don't die that day. Um, you're going to have to wait for that molt. You're going to have to wait for that next light phase before you actually see it take control. But it breaks up that life cycle and is extremely, extremely um, effective at that. And then we can also, of course, for added comfort, we want to make sure that we're spraying underneath it. Now, Proxite does have a little added label language. It does state that we want to have overhead covering uh, for when we're spraying Proxite, as well as um, chemical resistant gloves that are going to be 14 mils or greater in um, and thickness there. So again, something like this, I like to put down my face shield. I'm spraying above my head just to make sure I'm not getting any of that contact onto my face. So with that, that's really great coverage. Excellent. I'll kick it back to you, Chris. We have about seven minutes or so uh, for wrap up. Any questions? Yeah. So kind of to build off of that, we mentioned that Proxite is a new product for us. It is available on our early order program, uh, which started uh, just this week. Um, so talk with your, your, your territory manager or call into the, the Rainbow Scientific Office. It's your best pricing for 2021. You have free shipping and you have no payments until the 1st of uh, June, 2021. So make sure you reach out um, learn a little bit more about Proxite and some of the other great products uh, that we talked about today for your scale management. Um, with that, um, Patrick and I are available for questions. Um, we're, we're really excited that we had so many people attending. Um, what uh, questions do we have, Matt? Um, right. Got quite a few questions that came in, so we will. Excellent. All uh, right. First question. Sooty mold is common with infestations of spruce bud scale. Are they hard or soft scales? So if you see sooty mold associated with a scale, that's going to be a soft scale. Now, admittedly, I am not too familiar with that scale. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I live down here in the southeast. We don't really have those issues. So um, 
if you need more information or follow up on that, we could definitely um, put you in contact with your, your local territory manager to get more information. But that's I believe thing. that Spruce Bud Scale is a soft scale off the top of my head. Um, which brings up a great question um, or a point about you know, diagnostics. Google can be your best friend in diagnostics if you know how to use Google to search. Um, you know, if you know what you know, species of plant you're, you're dealing with um, and maybe that it is a soft scale, just Googling uh, scale insect on spruce soft, you can kind of sort through the, the, the search results and if it's you know, quality ones for maybe university extension services, you can get a pretty good idea or pretty close to what likely it is and how to manage it um, on top of, of reaching out to Rainbow. Indeed, but a key diagnostic between armored and soft scales is that if you have a scale insect that is producing honeydew and then the city mold's growing on it, that is going to be a soft scale versus armored scales which don't produce honeydew and, and therefore um, you don't see city mold. All right, next question. Uh, is there a reason to wait until spring to do the application instead of doing it in the fall? I think this I'm going to assume you're, you're referencing Zytec probably. Um, I prefer personally to do them in the spring because it gives you a longer control window into the late fall for some of those arm or soft scales, pardon me. Um, doing it in the fall, if you have early season, can be effective, but I think also moisture is a part of it as well. I want to make sure I'm getting good, good solid uptake. And more often than not, the spring you have more moisture in the soil. That's my personal. Pat Patrick, do you have any thoughts on that? I concur. If I had the choice, I would pick the spring. Um, but again, it's going to come down to the um, scale species, soil moisture, and um, plant size. So let's say, for instance, if I am dealing with a smaller canopy plant, good example actually would be something like maybe. Um, uh, crepe myrtle bark scale and crepe myrtle where I'm usually dealing with smaller canopy plants. Um, you know, I'm getting good fall soil moisture in many instances. Um, I'd be happy to do it there. Versus if I'm dealing with, um, you know, a larger tree, like again, maybe a mature oak tree, uh, and I'm dealing with a species that I have to worry about getting really good distribution up into the plant, that's where I'd probably uh, go with spring. Um, good question. Next question, uh, what is the effective length of protection with Zytec and Transtec? So with, with Transtec, I look at probably 90 days as your maximum window for efficacy. With, with uh, Zytec, I'm probably looking at closer to like 160 days, um, maybe 180 days. Right, next one. So for Transtech bark sprays, what time of the year should you stop? We are finding scale problems on new customers that we would like to treat now. So again, I would say that's going to depend upon uh, where, where you are in the country and, and you know how much season you have left. Um, so gen as a general rule, we say um, usually August is kind of like that magical time where we would um, stop spraying Transtech. Uh, again, August it means different to different people. Um, here in North Carolina, uh, you know, we're in mid-September and it's 77 degrees here today. So if I have an active scale infestation, um, I might go ahead and, and spray, knowing that's going to move into the plant very, very fast and distribute very, very quickly. Whereas if I'm uh, in more of a northern state um, and the plants might be starting to show some fall color or begin to show fall color, that might be one where I might just wait till next spring. Um, get more bang for my buck that way. Agreed. All right. And next question What's the best option for preventative treatment, say for something like Kermie scale on oaks? So I think it depends uh, a little bit on. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, no, yeah. It, it probably, I was going to say so for that case there, if it's purely preventative. Um, you know, Kermi scale being um, soft scale, that's something where, you know, Zytec in the spring annually uh, might be a, just a great option as a protected. Um, you know, just there's no sign it's either low population or no population, and you're just concerned with that uh, pest affecting the tree. Uh, Zytec's going to be a, an easy, low cost option for you. Whereas, um, you know, if 
you have an active infestation, um, that's where managing it quickly with a transtect, um, whether it be a bark spray or a trunk injection, depending upon how it's, um, you know, the tree and the site, um, it might be like a twofold combination, um, a complement, if you will, with the two products to manage the, the pest. And to build off of that, I think it's important to, you brought up a, it's almost indirectly client expectations um, for what your program is going to be. Whereas you need to communicate what the plan might be for not just, you know, the spring, but also the fall in that following spring, you know, that let's say with Kermi scale, you have an infestation this year, you treat it with, you know, transtech as a bark spray, you get it under control. The next part of that conversation might be, let's get it on a maintenance program with Zytec each spring uh, to keep that under control versus trying to do it as an ad hoc, just one-off kind of uh, application. I think that's an important point. All right, and I do know we are at time, but we do have a few more questions to go through. So we appreciate if you guys wanna stay on and listen to some more of these questions, feel free. Uh, moving on to the next one, uh, let's see, in a soil drench, is product absorbed through bark of roots or through root hairs? So the soil drench is going to be uptake by the roots. Um, now, that being said, um, you know, there is, there's a, a, a ton of data to show that uh, Dynatech and Transtech will take up to the bark. Um, there's data to show that imidacloprid will also take up to the bark, and though be, because it's slower, it's something we usually don't recommend. Um, uptake time that is, um, but you're really when you're doing that soil drench application, you're looking at targeting uh, mineral soil where those roots are, and that's where you're going to get that really effective control, and that's where the the research is um, pointing us. And one key thing I had mentioned there too, I just want to reinforce that is getting down to the mineral soil. Um, if you are pouring on top of duff layer or you're pouring on top of uh, mulch. That product's gonna get intercepted by that, and you're not gonna get as good um, uptake or, or really concentration product into the soil up into the tree. So you want to make sure you're creating a trench right around the base of that tree into mineral soil, where you're actually seeing maybe some of those little white roots, and then making your application there. That's a great distinction because it, it it can be a source of, especially in mulch layers or things like that, where you don't see as higher performance because it's being bound up by that mineral soil, or no, pardon me, not the mineral soil, by that, that duff layer. All right, next question. If the majority of the fine absorbing roots exist out at the drip line, why do we commonly see injections occurring so close to the trunk? This seems counterintuitive, oh, even though I realize that this is a common practice. Has the effectiveness of injection placement been researched much? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, Patrick. Okay, I love this question. So you're absolutely correct. You have all this, um, you know, this root hair growth, root tip growth that are constantly moving outside of the drip line and exploring uh, new areas to collect resources. Um, but if you think about how a root is, you have roots kind of like, in a sense, a little mini tree. So you have, uh, it comes out from the trunk and it has all these kind of rooting branches that are going off too. So even though it's out there exploring, in the interim, you have a lot of fine root hairs in that area. And so what the data has shown, and a lot of this comes from like emerald ash borer research, um, is that the closer you get to the tree, if you look at a, a volume of soil, by volume, you have more root hairs, closer you get to the tree than further away. So you still have a lot of roots out there, but as far as putting um, a product down for those roots to intercept, more roots are intercepting product the closer you get in from the tree. So again, it's just like, think about that branching pattern. Branches are kind of getting more spread out as they get farther out. But as they're coming in, there's just there's more. And so one is you have more roots closer into the tree. And then the second one is just a factor of um, movement in like distance. Closer into the tree, less distance it has to move up into the plant versus further out from the tree, it's more time it takes for it to move up into the tree. Good question though. That comes up a lot. That's a, that's a really good question. It's a great question. And a great response, Patrick. Thanks. Next question, when should crepe myrtle bark scale begin actively feeding in zone 7B? Oh, that's a good, that is a good question. I don't think anyone really knows yet. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, we have a trial right now in cooperation with Clemson where we're looking at life cycle in South Carolina and Columbia, specifically South Carolina. Um, and I'd have to look back at my notes. A lot of work is done in um, right now, some of the 
there's great work by a lot of institutions, but some really great work done by um, Auburn and Alabama Cooperative Extension. Um, and they see kind of an early spring kind of upkick. Um, and then again, kind of a, a late summer fall upkick. So I can't speak specifically to when they would be here in zone B, but if I were to throw kind of like a, a, a ballpark out there, it'd probably be um, February, February, March, late February, March. Um, we had a trial here, sorry, I keep on talking. Uh, we had a trial here about two years ago and we saw first crawlers in um, late February. Um, that's again, one site, one instance, um, but just an example is they can, as soon as it starts to warm up, you, you'll probably start seeing those guys move around and gals. All right, and I think we touched on Zytec residual already. Next one is uh, used a bark spray of Transtech on several red and sugar maples this spring. These trees are coated with gloomy scale. Is a bark spray less effective when scales are present in such numbers? Also, besides my trees doing better, is there a visual cue to judge control levels of the scales? Can't tell the difference between live and dead scales when they are there are thousands coating the bark. Yeah, that's a great question. So I can, the first part is uh, efficacy any different. So the past um, a couple of years, at least four years, we've done um, trials specifically with gloomy scale, heavy infestations, um, and we've found efficacy with a bark spray. Um, so, and where our protocol there was, we would actually, you know, take samples of the tree in um, NC State. Dr. Steve Frank would count the actual scales for us. It was alive and what's dead. Um, so again, thick, just crusty barks with a lot of old female tests on there. Seem to still get efficacy with that. Now, as far as, um, you know, another visual cue, unfortunately, you're right. Those, those scales, once they're dead, they, they hang on to that tree. Um, so it's going to be, you will see um, definitely an uptick in the vigor of the plant, the, the change in the leaf color. Um, the leaves will not be as chlorotic as fast, and you'll also hopefully hold on to those interior leaves. Seems like the interior of the plant filling out is, is your biggest visual cue. But yeah, outside actually going over there and taking out your hand lens and flipping over scale shells and seeing who's alive and dead, it's, it's tough to say. I know it's a tough one for your client too because they still see those scales on the trees uh, after your application. And that's an important distinction is that the scales, while dead, the shells may, you know, that, out, that waxy outer coating may remain on there for more than a growing season. So it, does, it doesn't eliminate and remove them unless you physically do it. All right, next question. Is an overdose detrimental to a tree? Gen generally speaking, um, with insecticides on the, in this case, um, you know, so with like Transtech, Zytec, um, no, you're not going to have any phytotoxic issues or anything like that. The one caveat to that would be with horticultural oil, um, that if you did overmix that or applied it, like Patrick said, outside the temperature limitations, that could be phytotoxic uh, for the plant as well and detrimental. Next one, uh, do you need an adjuvant like pentabark with the basal bark application? That's a great question too. So um, a lot of data, again, suggests don't need that, uh, a bark penetrant like uh, pentabark. We have a product very similar it's called scrimmage. Um, so you, a lot of data would suggest that you, you don't need that. And even our data um, would suggest that you, you don't need that. Um, now, that being said, um, it's not that much more expensive and it's only going to improve the efficacy of your solution. So I would still recommend it. Um, and this is outside of kind of the, the purview of this discussion. But we have found with our research with spotted lantern fly, which um, is a growing concern throughout the country uh, right now in Pennsylvania and a few other states, uh, we found that pencher bark did make a difference when we did bark sprays on on spotted lantern flies specifically um so so again for scale insects the data says that you don't need a bark surfactant our work has shown you that you don't necessarily need a back bark surfactant but um, as i mentioned it's only going to improve the efficacy of your solution it's not that much more so i would still um, recommend putting it in Right. This one kind of teams up well as the effectiveness of a basal bark spray limited by the thickness of a furrowed bark, for example, like an oak. Bark so again, thickness. Is, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh no. Go ahead. The bark thick. 
the bark thickness is not um, a, a, a significant factor in the efficacy. Um, the molecule is small enough and it, it, it's water soluble enough that it moves through that bark tissue um, that you, you, you can reasonably expect the same level, levels of control, whether it's a, a smooth barked tree or a, a thick bark corky tree like a, like a oak. Yep. All right. Uh, please elaborate on the regulated spray nozzle. Where to buy and complete identification? Uh, oh, so you can. Um, so the regulated. I assume you're meaning the the control flow valve that's on the the spray or the pump up sprayer for the backpack spray. Um, I bought mine from Amazon. <laughs> Not advocating for that. That's just where I found it. Um, they're pretty. They're um, they are. They're pretty easy to find uh, if you have like even a good, um, you know, uh, like some local hardware stores, uh, like an Ace Hardware or something like that will carry them as well. They're, they're pretty easy to find if you're looking for them. Um, and so that is that's that part. And then um, the other part of the we mentioned using that fan nozzle. Um, again, a lot of times when you buy a backpack sprayer, it's going to come with that hollow cone already installed. But many, I don't can't think of any that I've purchased that were, you know, more than the $10 kind uh, that also come, there'll be a little baggie in there that has a, a fan nozzle on there. So you just simply uh, unscrew it, put that fan nozzle on, screw it back on. It's pretty, pretty quick and easy uh, task. So, uh, and then again, likewise, um, the fan nozzles, there's all different sizes and settings and things like that that are, um, if you're looking for them, they become pretty easy to find. Mm -hmm. And we, we sell, uh, specifically, we sell the TJ8006 uh, is the fan nozzle that we provide. Um, we just, we like that one. <laughs> uh, next question is asking where they can get that backpack sprayer. Uh, so the, the, well, we had we had the one behind me, the Mariama, uh, the gas power backpack sprayer. Um, we sell this. Uh, and then the other one I use is the Chapin uh, manual pump up sprayer, uh, we sell that as well. Um, so reach out to your tech support or local territory manager and I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, help you out with getting one. All right, next one I think you've touched on but we'll go over again briefly. Is there any systemic foliage sprays uh, like Lagon 480 that may effectively translocate to kill scale? Uh, would you say that again, Matt? I'm sorry. Yeah, what was the chemistry they mentioned? Uh, it says Lagon 480, L-A-G-O-N, asking for any systemic foliar sprays. Um, so to answer, there's a few, I mean, so imidacloprid, Zytec, and Transpec also have labels uh, for foliar spray, and they would be uh, locally systemic or translaminar, depending on how you want to define that. So those would be some other options for you as well. Um, now, distinction there, they have those bee boxes, so you really have to make sure you're not spraying those um, during um, bloom or flower, because uh, then you would be off off label there. Um, there's a few other chemistries that are newer that are coming out, um, but there are a few options out there. Um, the nice thing with Proxite, though, again, is it's it is um, it's translaminar, and data shows that it, it's a really uh, low impact on a lot of these uh, predators and parasites out there. So um, we're big fans of of that as our, our foliar option for scales. And it works on both armored and soft scales very well. All right. Uh, is Proxite effective for elongate hemlock scale? It is. Yes. <laughs> There's data to show that as well. The active ingredient um, in other trials have shown effective on that. OK. Have you seen good scale control using neem oil for a crawler spray? I've seen mixed data personally. Um, the the challenge with, with neem oil, <clears throat> at least from what I've seen, is that it's less. It doesn't have the half life to it, um, so it, it has a very short span window uh, for that. So especially with crawlers that they have overlapping or maybe a longer you know emergence pattern, you can miss that window. Um, but it, it certainly shows some data that it does have some efficacy. Yes. All right. Uh, does Proxite need to be mixed with a spreader sticker? 
That's a great question. Yeah, so um, we recommend that it be mixed with um, horticultural oil at a very low rate. Uh, so that would be a half percent rate or um, a half a gallon per 100 gallons. Um, and at that rate, it does two things. One, it helps to, of course, break down the water tension of those droplets to help it coat. Uh, and especially on um, our armored scale insects, uh, that little bit of oil helps to kind of penetrate into that kind of waxy coating that they start to make. Um, so we do recommend that. Uh, in the absence of that, um, you know, if you forgot to bring horticultural oil with you that day or, or don't have it for whatever reason, um, we've used it uh, with a non ionic surfactant as well. Um, so that'd be another option. So uh, a product that we sell called Audible, uh, any non ionic surfactant. Again, mm -hmm. and the key there is just to break down the surface tension of that water so you're really yeah. coating down on the plant. And with peroxide, it's worth mentioning. It does line up, so if you if you had crawlers emerging and you were going to do maybe a trim tech uh, spray for your shrub growth regulation, you could tank mix those as well. Um, uh, it does tank mix very nicely with other materials as well. Good point. Yep. Next question: What ecological function do scales fulfill in nature, and how does their killing affect urban ecosystems? How should we consider thresholds when making decisions on how, when, or if to treat? Wow, that's like a whole other webinar, I think. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I can um, probably getting outside of uh, our wheelhouses. We are uh, but simple arborists managing urban landscapes, but you know. The scales in nature, a lot of these scales, you know, gloomy scale is a perfect example. Gloomy scale is a native scale insect, um, if you're familiar with that scale. Um, again, you walk out through the woods, you're probably hard pressed to find a lot of gloomy scales. When they come into this, it's when you take these trees out of where they're used to being, and you're putting them into this alien environment like, um, you know, an urban landscape, where you see their populations just are able to take off. Um, and there's a lot of great work um, on that exact subject by again North Carolina State University, uh, Steve Frank and a variety of his grad students. Um, so you'd like to Google like Steve Frank NC State scale insects. Uh, you'll find a lot of good work that can help answer that question. Um, so again, it's a lot of times it's, it's taking these trees out of where they want to be in the woods and putting them in somebody's front yard or in a planting strip that they then tend to have issues. Um, so that's like an example of like a native scale, same as like Lacanian scale. Uh, we have both native and we have in, introduced Lacanian scales. Um, and then, you know, an example here behind me, you know, we have something like a T scale, which is non-native uh, on a plant, a camellia, that's not native. Um, so, you know, the, the questions of the uh, ecology of, of uh, the foothills of North Carolina in this plant and this scale is, is up to question for sure. Um, I don't know. I think I probably just kind of more dodged your question than anything, but you can look into the work by Steve Frank and Kirk. I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, I was going to say, I was going to add to that. Scales are a, a food source for many other, other arthropods as well. So that's partially what their, their role is. Um, and, and you're exactly right. We don't, in the native landscape, you don't see the scale populations that we have or you see in the urban environment. As far as a threshold, um, that, you know, from a non-agricultural or nursery uh, standpoint, the threshold is honestly whatever your client dictates. Um, you know, if, if there are sooty mold issues or the honey mold, honeydew issues are the concern, um, it might be a very low threshold. But if you're judging it based on maybe plant damage or aesthetics, you may have a higher tolerance for a population of scale um, than other places. Um, but certainly also I think a part is the scale species. Some are slower or take longer to really build, whereas I think of like Euonymus scale, it can go from having clean plants to the plants are almost decimated within a single growing season because they can have so many uh, generations and just feed so aggressively. So it kind of, it kind of depends. Um, that's kind of my initial thought. All right, next question. I've read and heard conflicting information about crepe myrtle bark scale management. Would you manage it more like a soft scale or armored scale? Uh, would imidacloprid be effective or would you recommend dinotepheron for systemic treatment? That's a good question. So crepe myrtle bark scale falls outside of, um, you know, we talk about generally lumping scales into armored or soft scales. Um, and those are generally, those are the big two groups we deal with in most of the parts of the United States as far as pests. 
Primero bar scale falls into actually a third category called a felt scale. Um, so they're unique in that they feed much like a soft scale, as in they're feeding in that kind of um, phloem area. Um, but then they have multiple overlapping generations like an armored scale was. So um, from a product standpoint, um, we manage it like a soft scale. We think of it like a, a soft, when we're choosing products, we think of it like a, a soft scale would. Um, that one though brings in a lot of questions um, as far as using the neonicotinoids and then um, amount of that getting into the flowers and then affecting um, insects feeding on the flowers. So that brings in a whole other kind of wrinkle about like, you know, what product manages the scale the best, but then unintended consequences of using that. Um, which again, using something like insect growth regulator uh, might be a good tool in that toolbox. So, you know, combining dormant oil sprays with crawler sprays or, you know, peat crawler sprays and an insect growth regulator um, might be a way to manage that scale. Um, again. Next question, uh, is peroxide similar to talus insect growth regulator? So peroxide is similar to a talus is a, um, it, in, oh shoot, what does it do? Talus is different. <laughs> talus in, it's a slightly different mode of action. Yeah. Um, yeah, talus inhibits, uh, I think it's, what I, I'm not gonna pronounce the right, but the, the material that the insect's body is made from, like the hard stuff, I've been blanking on the name. It, it interferes with that. Whereas distance is a juvenile hormone mimic. So um, it basically you're spraying more hormone on, it mimics the hormone that keeps plants young. And that's why, yeah. that's how it, it breaks up their life stage. All right, this one is for Patrick. Uh, where can I find a helmet like yours with a clear visor? It's a great question. Uh, <laughs> uh, we used to provide these. I'm not sure if we still do. Um, again, there's a local hardware store by me where I, where I buy them. Um, you can find them from uh, various uh, vendors online as well. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you have any good places to. Um, to so I, I think like Husqvarna sells one that can have like the glass, like the, not the glass, but a plastic face shield to it. Um, but yeah, online is typically where I would look. I, that's a good question. I don't know whether do we if we still provide those helmets or not. I, I think they were mostly with the air spades. I think. Um, I'll yeah. double check that. We'll have to get back to you. All right, next question. Uh, looks like we only have a couple more. Uh, we have seen resistance build up to the European elm scale with Neonix in the front range of Colorado. Is this the case in other areas? Not that, that we're aware of. Um, that's a really rare. So having insect resistance build up in like a landscape or forest scenario is really, really unique. Um, and you know, out there in the front range, it's such kind of like a, it's an isolated area and isolated population that it's it's um, it is uh, very rare um, and not too many documented cases of where you get insecticide resistance on a population um, outside of these really unique scenarios. Um, you have it built up in like greenhouses and like closed systems, but out in the landscape, that's really rare. So you guys are just uh, just lucky out there in the front range. You guys get to be the exception. Yeah. <laughs> there is actually a second part. I was looking through other ones. Um, if, if they have built up resistance to Zytec, would you expect them to be resistant to Transtech as well? That's a good question. They, they could be. Uh, again, same mode of action there. Um, so they could be. That's where I'd be looking at maybe alternatives, um, you know, like um, an acetate, like Lepitec. Um, I was actually just looking at a, a paper from Dr. Crenshaw out there that talked about using um, aracinate, abamectin, to, to manage that scale. Uh, not saying that's my recommendation, it's just a perusing that I just looked at not long ago. Um, but that's where I'd be looking at those. And again, if you have the ability to spray uh, those large trees um, and you're not getting the pushback, and you know, again, the site allows itself, um, you know, foliar sprays of um, distance at crawler phase. Um, might be a way to help as well. And to build off of that, sometimes the, the the concentration of active ingredient varying that. So um, that's where maybe like the trunk injection of transtech infusible, you're getting a, a higher concentration faster 
Um, or I mentioned Lepitec briefly as a, as a possible option, you know, in some of those kind of circumstances. So in your insect resistance program, adjusting the AI and also the concentrations can be a, a way to overcome or reduce some of those issues that you might uh, uh, look at for insect resistance uh, concerns. Great question though. All right, next one. How, how, how long can you store mixed trans tech? That's a good question. Um, and gosh, one of the, somebody on our tech support team answered that really well the other day. Um, but our basic recommendation is gonna come down to, you wanna use it up within 24 hours. Um, and that's also gonna be based upon its exposure. So if it's in like a clear container out in the middle of the sun, it might break down a little bit faster versus if it's uh, protected, cool, and out of the sun. But um, basically 24 hours is your, your uh, what we're recommending there to make sure efficacy is. True. All right. Uh, can root soil fertilization be used to increase the uptake of a treatment application? Another good question. Um, I know that in the early days of uh, you know the old merit days, that was um, commonly um, thought of to help, uh, and that was based on a paper. Um, again, I can't remember all the details. But I think since then, I might be wrong. I think since then they found that there's no need to um, add like a, a fertilization with that um, to help with uptake. Um, I know that's not something we recommend. I'm, yeah, it's not a recommendation, and I'm not aware of like a direct you know link between the two. But certainly, when you're doing soil applications, soil moisture is absolutely critical. So I know like in the front range, winter watering is is very important. Um, but making sure or encouraging the homeowner to irrigate beforehand is going to give you uh, that is documented much better uptake and distribution. Yeah, soil moisture is going to be key with any systemic application, whether it be a soil application, a bark spray, or, or a trunk inject. All right, great that question. Is all the questions. Uh, thanks everyone for wow. sticking around. Um, and if any of you have any other questions in regards uh, to this webinar, feel free to contact our solutions center. Um, and we will be taking care of the CEU process. Uh, if you have entered your ISA number upon registration or typed into the chat box, we will send that into ISA and then they will get those entered for you. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thank everybody, you. for your time. Have a good one.